Okay, today we're going to be looking at Buddhism, so let me get right to it. Uh, again, when we are looking at religion, okay, we need to study religion, and I'll say this every time we come to religion, we need to study the religion as the gods of the creation of people, okay? Again, this will just help us uh, be able to look at the societies, the cultures, and identify their values and how that religion cre was created. Um, if we look at it the other way around, if we look at societies or people being the creation of gods, then we move into that area of religion where things are taken by faith and we won't have a quality discussion. We won't be able to get to any real truth there. So again, let's look at religion as the um, creation of people. Gods is the creation of people and not the other way around. Again, for religious beliefs, talk to your parents, talk to your priests, talk to those people because I don't want to teach you religion. I'll teach you what other people believe, but I'm not going to teach you what you should believe. Okay, with Buddhism. Okay, Buddhism is fascinating. This is a lot of fun. Okay, as most of you know, I did spend a little bit of time in the Far East. Lived in Japan for a year. We also toured Korea, um, Hong Kong, Macau area, and then also toured all of Vietnam. So those are primarily Buddhist countries, and it's a very interesting uh, culture there. The story of Buddha. Okay, now Buddha is very similar to Christ, uh, where his birth was foretold. And um, he was, the birth of Buddha was, was somewhat miraculous. Okay, his mom was traveling and she started to feel birth pains. And so she was uh, in the forest and the trees bent down and help her, helped her give birth to uh, Siddhartha, her son. Um, when Siddhartha was born, he was born walking and talking. And he said that he had come to be the redeemer of the earth. Um, now, as he grew older, his father was a king. And as a king, he did not want Siddhartha to be religious. He wanted Siddhartha to be a, a king, to be a politician. And so he protected Siddhartha. He kept him in these palaces. I think there were three palaces, if I remember right. And in those palaces, um, Siddhartha had one for spring, one for winter, and one for the rainy season, I believe. And so he would move around only in those palaces. And he was never allowed to see pain or suffering or anyone that had any physical ailments. Um, his father thought that if he'd been exposed to those things, that Siddhartha might move more toward the religious side of life. And he wanted to keep Siddhartha away from those things. So there was one time that Siddhartha heard somebody singing uh, somewhere in the palace and it was a woman and it was a, a very sad song. And so he asked her what it was about. And she said that it was about her homeland and that she missed her homeland. And that gave him these feelings of like, what is this? What is this feeling? I, I want to know more about it. And so he was able to uh, convince his father to let him tour the kingdom. And as he toured the kingdom, he left his palace guards and he saw people who were sick and dying. And he came back and said, my job is to rid the earth of pain. No more sickness, no more dying, no more of this uh, that, he, that he saw. And so he left. The story goes that a fog came over the city, his palace knocked everyone out so they were asleep. And he, by that time he had been married and had a son. And he left his wife and son to go save them, to redeem them from the life of pain. Um, he did not know. So he was seeking enlightenment. He did not know what enlightenment was quite yet, but he wanted to figure that out. And so as he left the palace, he joined this group called the ascetics. These were people that would deny themselves food. They don't let birds feed them. Uh, they denied themselves any comfort, no nice clothes. They wouldn't take baths. They were, I mean, they just meditated on God. And we do have religious traditions that are very aesthetic, where they deny themselves physical um, comforts. Uh, in Christianity, we have monks. In fact, there's an early Christian, I think he was in Syria, where he sat on top of a pole for 40 years. And uh, people would feed him. Uh, he'd drop a basket down, and he'd haul his food up in a basket. 
and any waste he created was dropped down in another basket and hauled away by people down below. But he stayed there for 40 years. Um, we do have a hermit tradition in different religions. Christianity is one of them. Um, now, Buddhist monks nowadays also take a vow of poverty and where they will live devoting their life toward the study of Buddhism and toward enlightenment. Now, Buddha, uh, or Siddhartha, before he became the Buddha, uh, was seeking enlightenment, so he denied himself all forms of physical comfort. Uh, it was then that he heard someone say, I think as a musician, say, if you tighten a string too tight, it'll snap. And if you let it too loose, it won't play. And so you need to have it tuned just right. And that's where Buddha or Siddhartha realized the best way to approach life was not by denying himself comfort, but by following what he called the middle way. Uh, now the middle way was um, not going to any extremes. Okay, don't stretch yourself too thin, you'll snap. Don't um, be too loose because you're not going to produce anything. And so finding that middle ground was what was important to him. And he did this under what was called the, the Bodhi tree. And in the Bodhi tree, or under the Bodhi tree, um, in fact, I believe the Bodhi tree is a sacred symbol now, uh, but he, in, he encountered or attained enlightenment. And so from then on, he was known as the Buddha or the teacher. And because he began teaching people this method or this idea. Now, as the teacher, um, he came across these four noble truths. First, life is suffering. And I, I repeat myself, everything about life is suffering. When you're born, you're born in pain. When you die, you die in pain. Everything in life is painful. Um, having things you don't want is painful. Not having things you do want is painful. And so desire, uh, those things that you want and don't want, all contribute to this pain. Um, even having something you don't want very much is painful because you won't have it forever. It won't, will not last. And so everything in life is painful. The next thing he discovered was to um, the cause of suffering, a desire. So if you could just give up wanting anything, you wouldn't have any pain. Now, this is where I really start to look at Buddhism and go, does that make sense? In some ways it does. On a, when I think about it, yes, it does. But then on an emotional side, it's like, ah, I don't know if I can do this. Um, I love my friends. I love my family. Uh, and so my desire not to associate with them is very strong. Or my desire to associate with them is very strong. Um, I don't know if life would be enjoyable without that. Okay. But Buddha, he was saying, you got to give up seeking pleasure. You got to give up um, these ideas of desire uh, because that way you will not be sad. You'll not uh, suffer pain. And so, yeah, the third one is to end suffering. You got to give up desiring things. Stop wanting to be with your friends stop wanting different things and just reality to buddha was inside himself it was a spiritual world and we will get to that because um to end suffering it would lead you to that eightfold path now right thought um uh, siddhartha thought that if you thought of things correctly that would um, lead you to this uh, enlightenment. Now, another thing is right intent. Uh, right intent, hmm. Most people can do something if they have the right intention. Um, most religions do go to war, but most religions also have that commandment of not killing anything. Uh, later on, it does say, uh, cause no harm to others. So you can't kill. But Buddhists also will go to war. Okay, Christians go to war, and they have a "Thou shall not kill" commandment. So do Jews. So do Muslims. Okay, most religions have this commandment not to harm other people or other living things. Um, 
but with intent, okay, you can um, do things. So if you intend things properly, you can do things without sinning. Uh, there's a story, and we won't get to Japan this year, um, just because we don't have time with the limits we have. But there's a story of a samurai that I will talk about. It's in the 47 Ronin. And one samurai was supposed to kill somebody. And he had this person he was supposed to kill trapped. And he drew his sword and was ready to kill him. But the victim, the person about ready to die, spat in the samurai's face. And the samurai put his sword away and walked away. Because at that moment, he was angry. And he intended to kill him out of anger, uh, which would not have been right because the samurai being a Buddhist, he did not want to sin. And so he went, he meditated, came back to the victim, got rid of his anger and killed him. Okay. It was his duty to kill him. That was his job. But as long as he didn't do it with hate or anger, it was okay. And so that intent part was very important. Uh, we do several things in our life, you know, depending on, um, you know, our beliefs and some things we can do might be done in a correct way or an incorrect way. In Buddhism, you have to do something without desire. You can't want to do it. It has to be part of your job. Um, eating, for example, okay, uh, when you eat. You eat because it's time to eat, because it's lunchtime, not because you want to eat. Now, some Buddhists, um, okay, many Buddhists, not all, but many Buddhists will be vegetarian. Um, maybe I should say that the extreme Buddhists, the, the very strict Buddhists will be vegetarian, um, but they will eat meat. Uh, I've read stories where a Buddhist monk who's a vegetarian will eat a steak because that is what you you provided for him to eat. And so he eats it, not because he wants to, but because it is time to eat. And that is what has been offered. Now, Buddhists, this is kind of tricky because I'm going to say want and hope. Uh, Buddhists will not want, or they, they hope not to be fed food that is too tasty because that might create a desire in them for that food again, a craving. And so they want to have their food be nutritious, but not too delicious because all of a sudden that creates a problem where they want it. And so they'll try to avoid that. And again, these are all, I'm giving you guys very extreme, uh, the monastery, the monk, those versions, not necessarily the, the everyday Buddhist uh, person. Okay, right speech, no idle, no idle talk, uh, no lies. And so your words must have purpose. Okay, right action, no harming others. Um, now, even your job should be right, right livelihood, don't hurt anybody. Your right effort, and that is where you try to prevent evil and try to do well, do good for others. Now, right mindfulness. Right mindfulness talks about where your mind is um, and where you focus your energies. And then right concentration, practice through, through uh, meditation. One thing Buddha taught is that um, your the real world or the physical world in Buddhism is not the real world. The real world is up here in your mind. Okay, the spiritual world is where it is real. Uh, the physical world, not real. Okay, this is an illusion, and so Buddhists will go through life, treating life as an illusion. I'm not hungry because my body isn't real. I'm not cold because my body isn't real. These are just things my mind is trying to trick me into thinking. Um, so they will try to focus their mind, be very intentful on what is uh, real, what is appropriate for themselves. Um, and again, the spiritual world is real. Now that can be dangerous because if you're not real, okay, how would I treat you? Um, so it can be taken somewhat in a negative way. So if I don't see people as real, that we're all just spiritual beings, how do we act? 
And Buddha said, you must treat everyone else as if they are real and treat them because that spiritual being within the person is the reality, not the person himself. And so we must treat everything with respect and love and, and take care of them. Uh, now, Buddha began his teachings as a challenge to Hinduism. Okay, when we looked at Hinduism, we had that caste system. And that caste system was very strict. Um, and so when Buddha started his teachings, he first off taught that we don't need to sacrifice animals anymore because that was a Hindu practice and that is not what we should do. The other is uh, each individual should work toward that enlightenment, that it wasn't the priest's job to do enlightenment. It was all of our jobs to be enlightened and to be uh, faithful. And he really attacked that caste system. Okay. Buddhism brought the, the religious faith from just the Brahmins all the way down to everyone. And so he was saying we should all strive for uh, enlightenment. Now, he also said that we should avoid those extremes and to follow that middle way. And so um, that seems to be very balanced in many ways. Now, there are key ideas. This, this is fascinating. There is no God in Buddhism. Now, I believe that the devil might be a, a demon named Mara, but there is no God. Uh, Buddha was just one of the teachers that was in the ancient world. Now, this is important. It's hard to imagine, but Buddhism says the world you see is an illusion. It's not real. Uh, nothing is real. And so... There is no death. So when somebody dies, that is just one vessel that is passing on because that the spirit, that soul, continues to live. And so just because someone you love dies, don't be sad because that it's just the vessel. They are going to return. They'll come back. Now, the goal of Buddhism is to achieve nirvana, that uh, becoming one with that God spirit. In Hinduism, it was becoming one with Brahman. In Buddhism, you want to become, you want to end that birth and life cycle. They also believe in reincarnation. And once you end that life and birth cycle, you become one with Nirvana, the God spirit. Now, this is something that I, when we talk about this with Hinduism a little bit, but um, when you die, okay, your body will decompose and you have these basic elements that your body will break down into and you will become fertilizer. It sounds weird, but you'll become fertilizer, grow grass, animals eat you. And so those molecules that you were made up of will be, or that matter you're made up of will evolve into something else. Um, Buddha, for some, somehow he, his matter, something about his soul had memory. And so as he would change forms in the different life forms, he could remember his past lives. Uh, he is the seventh of the ancient Buddhas, I believe, or the fourth. There were three that were preceded that had these spiritual, lived 100,000 years type thing. Um, but when it came down to the four Buddhas before him, uh, they were not the ones that actually founded Buddha or founded Buddhism. They're people that... Uh, led the way toward Buddhism. And so he could remember those past lives because he was all seven of those people. It wasn't until he became Siddhartha that he actually brought Buddhism, those teachings, to other people. And that is when people started to follow his teachings. Now, he had multiple incarnations, thousands of incarnations, lived millions of years, uh, according to Buddhism. And so he his memory goes back millions of years um when he died okay there was an emperor in northern india named ahsoka and ahsoka uh, took up buddhism and actually sent missionaries out and so buddhism did become a moving force for um the far east okay it is one of the first missionary faiths uh christianity is also a missionary faith for People are sent out to teach others about its faith. Judaism, not so much. Judaism, they they don't have that missionary. You don't go out and teach someone how to live. 
uh, you, you should be born into it. And they do take converts, but it is um, not something that you go out and seek. Islam is a missionary type faith where uh, Muslims will try and convert people to their faith. Hinduism is not. Okay, here is a map of modern Buddhism. Um, Siddhartha, like I said, was one of the ancient seven Buddhas. And when you look at the map, we do have, okay, Buddhism did begin in northern India. It started out here. But when uh, he died, it wasn't, it didn't take off very rapidly, a generation or so after it took off. And it spread to the Far East. And you have different variations, three major schools of, of Buddhism. You have, and I can't even pronounce these, but the Vaharana, Varana, Vahara, yeah, the Mahayana and the Theravada. Now, when I lived in Japan, I was exposed to that Mahayana uh, sect. And it was interesting because in Japan, there was a school of Buddhists or a Buddhist monastery section. It was called Koyasan up uh, a little bit, um, I want to say west and south of Osaka. And it was a mountaintop um, religious monastery location. They had 50 monasteries up there. And they taught esoteric Buddhism, which is a part of Mahayana. And esoteric Buddhism would teach you that uh, it's all our responsibilities to seek enlightenment. And it was pretty cool. Now, I went up there because I am vegetarian, and uh, they're famous for their vegetarian cooking. Uh, it's called Sojin Rory, I believe. Um, but it's a, a very cool experience to go up and see how the Buddhists do their worship services. Now, um, the other versions of Buddhism, okay, I, I'm not really sure on how they teach or what variant, variation they have, but they are different variations. The Dalai Lama, he comes from Tibet, which is a uh, part of that uh, Vaj Vajrayana, Vajrayana sect. Now, this, I, I some kids have seen it, but I, I don't know what it's rated. I think it's at least PG-13. There's a movie out there called The Matrix. And The Matrix is kind of mind-bending because it talks about this one kid and I can't even remember his name but he goes through life and he realizes that his life is an illusion and the matrix if you've ever watched it the matrix is based on that teaching that uh, life is an illusion it's a buddhist type movie that takes its inspiration from buddhism uh, but life is an illusion and the real world is something that is not what we see not what we hear not what we taste um, it is elsewhere it's in our mind, okay? Um, I'll post an assignment with this. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. There are my sources, just a couple, uh, along with the textbook. And uh, it's great talking to you. Enjoy your day. See ya.